Murray in his home. Our team on the scene, the evidence discovered, the doctor's note, the prescription medication, and now the girlfriend. Also breaking tonight, the saga is finally over. Amanda Knox's murder conviction just overturned tonight by Italy's Supreme Court. She will not be sent back. The deadly explosion, the search for the missing tonight, survivors jumping to safety. And at this hour, authorities reveal early signs of the culprit. Federal charges tonight, the police officer indicted after this takedown of an Indian man. After a neighbor reports a suspicious man in the neighborhood. He was a grandfather visiting his family. And behind the wheel, the driver's ed teachers who think they're teaching a real student. They have no idea she's a professional racer. From ABC News World Headquarters, this is ABC World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and we begin with two breaking stories. Amanda Knox and that murder conviction overturned. There will be no extradition to Italy, and we're in her hometown in Seattle in just a moment. But first, new developments in the case of that down jet, the co-pilot locking the captain out, flying straight into a mountain. Tonight, what we've just learned about him and this new image of him running in Germany. Of course, part of his flight training right here in the U.S. Investigators now finding clues in his home, prescriptions, a note from his doctor saying he was too sick to work. At the crash site tonight, the remains of the victims being lifted out. An American flag honoring the three American victims. And tonight, we now learn about his girlfriend and his mysterious hiatus during flight training. We do have team coverage again tonight. ABC's chief foreign correspondent, Terry Moran, where evidence has been hauled away in Germany. He was an avid runner, the picture of health and youth. But investigators now say Andreas Lubitz had a secret that turned homicidal. They are scrutinizing his last 24 hours. The day of the crash, Lubitz left his apartment in Dusseldorf. Neighbors say he shared it with a girlfriend. You see those two names on the buzzer. He went to the airport in the morning, flew to Barcelona in the same plane. He would later crash on the return flight over those same mountains. Tonight, police searching that apartment again after their bombshell find last night. A torn up note from a doctor determining that on the day of the crash, Lubitz was too sick to work and prescriptions for medications also trashed. That note never delivered to the airline. The deceased hid his illness from his employer and colleagues, the prosecutor says. And tonight, an unconfirmed report in the Wall Street Journal that Lubitz was seeing a psychiatrist. As we learn, he apparently struggled for years. Back in 2009, as a flight student, he interrupted his training for an extended period, German media reporting he suffered depression or burnout. But at the little flight club in his hometown, people who knew him saw no warning signs. As you're flying, you need to have some, some minimum, I would say, intelligence, some minimum respect for your, your, yourself, some minimum respect for the life of, of others. These are the gliders of the local flight club. They're packed up for winter, but it was here in these that Andreas Lubitz first discovered his love of flying. The club took those gliders on trips. Lubitz reportedly came, too, to these same mountains where he would have soared alone just a few miles from where, years later, he crashed Flight 9525. And, David, the Associated Press is now reporting that Lubitz's file with the German government's aviation authorities included a note that said the pilot required, quote, specific, regular medical examination. No word on a reason. David? Terry Moran leading us off tonight. Terry, thank you. And tonight, the airline's facing tough new questions over how they screen their pilots for mental health. And a major development tonight when it comes to how many people must be in the cockpit at all times. ABC's David Curley on that part of the story. With the airline industry still reeling after this chilling crash, Lufthansa reversed itself. Hours after defending its policy of allowing just one pilot to fly a jetliner for short periods of time, it will now require two people in the cockpit. Europe's aviation agency recommending that all airlines do the same, adopt what is already policy in the U.S. This is many ask, how are pilots psychologically screened? Andreas Lubitz was not only tested by Lufthansa, he was also issued a medical certificate by the FAA. But getting a psychological clearance in aviation often involves little, if any, actual screening or time with a psychologist. It's generally just conversation, kind of getting your impressions from conversation. In fact, an initial FAA medical clearance requires a physical exam and a questionnaire asking if there is any sort of mental disorder, depression, or anxiety. And there are at least annual checkups with a doctor, 
but no face-to-face -face time with a psychologist. People fall through the cracks. There's no set standard for how we're supposed to evaluate these people. So the first doctor or the second doctor can completely vary on their interpretation of, or their perception of an individual pilot. And David Curley is with us here in the studio tonight. And David, it sure would seem that if someone did have mental illness and wanted to get into that cockpit, that they could find a way to hide this. Under these current systems, even the one here in the U.S., that does seem to be a possibility. And some pilots are wary of even talking to a psychologist about issues they might be having, fearful that that information is going to go straight to the FAA and it could jeopardize their pilot's license. All right, David Curley, who's been with us all week long. David, thank you. And I want to bring in ABC News aviation consultant John Nance tonight, a veteran pilot himself. And John, we all know that you flew commercial jetliners for 27 years. What kind of tests did you go through every year? Every year I had a flight physical, and when I became a captain, it was every six months. But, you know, there was no uh, psychological component to that. Unless you walked in the uh, doctor's office uh, acting goofy, there wasn't anything that he asked you about psychology. But certainly this is going to start a discussion about mental health in the cockpit. Absolutely, and, and we have to have that discussion, and it has to be pretty much worldwide. All the airlines are going to have to get to that question. Is it something that we can look for? Is there something that we can reliably ferret out? And, John, you were with me here last night calling for new global guidelines, two people in the cockpit at all times, you said, not just for pilots here in the U.S., and you heard Lufthansa's decision today. Do you think other airliners are going to follow suit? I think pretty much every airline on the planet has to follow suit. It's basically something we can do right now to absolutely minimize the possibility of this ever happening again, and that's what we have to do. All right, John Nance with us again tonight. John, thank you. We turn now to the breaking news from Italy tonight and reaction right here in the U.S. The fate of American Amanda Knox finally decided. The former college student and her boyfriend accused of killing her roommate. Late today, Italy's highest court overturning her murder conviction. ABC's Neil Karlinski in her hometown in Seattle, where tonight Amanda Knox is, quote, tremendously relieved and grateful. After nearly eight years and three trials, Italy's highest court tonight annulled Amanda Knox's murder conviction, overturning once and for all the murder case that has shadowed Knox much of her adult life. It was a stunning turn of events. This is very surprising, since this was the same court that had effectively overturned the not guilty verdicts before. In fact, most expected the next battle would be over extradition and the question of whether Knox would ever return to Italy, something Knox herself was adamant about. I will never go willingly back to the place where I... I'm going to fight this until the very end. After being convicted of murdering her roommate Meredith Kircher in 2009, then acquitted and freed two years later, only to be convicted again last year, the prospect of a fourth trial had left Knox in a constant state of worry. Tonight, at last, the long nightmare is over. Knox's family telling ABC News tonight they are incredibly emotional and very relieved. Next up for Knox, they hope, planning a wedding. She is engaged and looking forward to getting on with the rest of her life. David? All right, Neil Karlinski with late reaction from Seattle tonight. Neil, thank you. And now to the urgent search this evening for the missing. After that explosion and seven alarm fire right here in New York, 22 injured. This video capturing the initial blast there and then the inferno. Some of those fires still burning tonight. A sea of firefighters on the ground. One of the missing this evening, this young man on a date at a nearby restaurant when the explosion hit. Tonight, authorities revealing the early clues now point to a gas leak as the culprit. ABC's Ron Claiborne on the scene again tonight. This is how it looks tonight. Three buildings obliterated. What was once homes of dozens of people, now just a huge pile of rubble. This video shows the chilling moment when the initial explosion rocked a ground floor sushi restaurant. Tonight, at least two people remain unaccounted for. A busboy at that restaurant and 23-year-old Nicholas Figueroa, who was there on a lunch date. So now when he's not here, we're, like, we're barely falling apart now. Like, he's not going to be in our family if we don't find him. <laughs> New York City's mayor said today, early signs point to someone tampering with a gas line. Gas leaks were the suspected cause of a massive explosion and fire in East Harlem last year that killed eight people. This controlled explosion by a Minnesota fire department shows just how powerful a gas explosion can be. In the East Village explosion, this video shows an off-duty firefighter helping a woman down from a fire escape, then checking for others, even as smoke begins pouring out of the building. As I got to, like, the, uh, 
third floor, I could feel the heat and the smoke. Only moments after he climbs down, the building is consumed in flames. And tonight, this startling new detail, the restaurant owner smelled gas before the explosion. But instead of calling 911, he called his landlord. And by the time the landlord arrived half an hour later to check it out, the building blew up. David? Wow, a powerful reminder for so many. Ron Claiborne, thank you. Now to a police officer indicted tonight, a case out of Alabama after a...